Perfect. <laughs> okay. Hello, Adriana. So nice to meet you today. So, hi, Yuti. So nice to meet you too. Uh, we are far away, but uh, internet brings us together. So, I'm here for a question at Venturesis to maybe some of you already know me, but I'm going to do this interview and hope you like it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah, you have been here before actually telling Crystal all about the Marsha, the big in, uh, yeah. endurance race for Kriosho horses. So today I want to ask you a little bit more about your professional life as a vet or as a horse vet in Brazil. Because uh, I can imagine Brazil, the horse riding thing. I don't know Brazil actually, but I've been in Argentina and there is a very male dominated sports. And particularly with the Criollos, uh, with the um, Brazilian and Argentinian cowboys riding on the horses and, and uh, tending the cattle, it's, it's all, I guess, men. So you as a woman, uh, I guess there's not a lot of female vets or whole female horse vets in Brazil. Well, today I think the profession is dominated by women. But when I graduated back in 87, 1987, it was not so. From a group of 50 people that entered the graduation, there were only nine women. I see. Mm. So, and not all of this got to the end of their five years. Right, I see. So, and when I graduated, uh, I found uh, many things difficult because I was a woman many horse vets, they would not uh, accept uh, women for doing the obligatory practice that uh, is at the end of the course. Right. So it was uh, hard for me to find it. So I went to the Porto Alegre Jockey Club to do my final work. And then I said, uh, I thought, uh, I want to do that, <laughs> but I don't like uh, jockey club practice. I want something that I like more. So they, I learned that it was a farm that belonged to the jockey club where they received uh, the Toro bread mares and they have some stallions. And in the breeding season, I went there and spent four months uh, assisting Fallings, uh, doing uh, pregnancy checks and uh, follicle control, everything. I see. So I, and then I graduated, and there was a, a time that was a bit of a crisis in Brazil. So the jobs were not so easy to find. Then I went to work in a lab, uh, a micro microbiology lab. So I learned uh, many things that I would use it afterwards, but I didn't know already. But uh, because my master and my PhD job, the uh, works, they involved a lot of microbiology. I see. So did you... Uh, Straight from the beginning, did you specialize in horses or did you basically do generally veterinary practice? No, I specialized in horses, but there was one year that I worked in a, in a small town where they did mostly dairy cattle. Excellent. That was also a learning, bit, but working with dairy cattle is, I think, is heavy. Duty hard because work. hard work. Uh, yes. And when I did my first uh, uterine plurilapse, I think, uh, no, this is not for me. <laughs> because it's very common in Holstein cows that they put the uterus out after calving, but uh, in, in mares it doesn't uh, happen frequently. No, and horses, it's rare, I see. It's very rare. Uh, then I went to work in farms in the state of Sao Paulo, or 
Warm Blood Farms. Hmm. So I, from the beginning, I started with thoroughbreds. Then I went to the warm blood. But uh, you cannot uh, be uh, just one breed veterinarian. Here in Brazil, it's a lot of uh, diversity of uh, breeds. And then we have in Sao Paulo, the Manga Larga, right. which is a gated horse, uh, and very nice horses too. Uh, but in the warm blood, uh, and then I went back to my state, we were in the soul to work in a thoroughbred farm mm -hmm. uh, in Bagé. Bagé is actually close where I live now, also at the Uruguay border. And they have a lot of thoroughbred farms and also lots of Criollo farms. Mm -hmm. And I was working there, and my now husband at the time, he, he was my boyfriend, and he is an engineer, and he, he passed the examination for the master degree in Porto Alegre. And it's like uh, 400 kilometers. And he suggested that I try it. Hmm. But I said, oh, I don't know anyone from the from the university in Porto Alegre because I graduated in another university, maybe not, uh, I don't know. And I was talking to uh, another farm owner when I went there to to see a, a horse of his, uh, and he said, uh, why don't you try? The professor there, he is my cousin. I can give you a, a letter and uh, if he doesn't uh, accept you, he, he will have to see with me because I, I uh, indicated him for, for his first job. <laughs> so everything was... So I went there, I passed and quit the farm and started working in Porto Alegre. Parallel to my master, I began to see other farms uh, and I became involved with the miniature horse. That was another story. <laughs> because I'm very small and, uh, and um, then no one would dare to examine a mini mare right. before. And one day, I, as was, I was at a horse show when there was this stallion, he was colicking. And everyone was crazy because it was one champion miniature horse <laughs> and uh, all colic. And so they came to me and we will do rectal palpation to see if he has a torsion. I was, I, uh, I don't think so. But uh, we actually we saved the horse because we found a tube that would pass the the nose of and could drain the stomach content. So right. he passed, and uh, then the owner was very happy and said. You say you, you see with this arm of yours, you could <laughs> palpate mini mares. We could inseminate them and do everything that you do in the big mares. You can do. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, you can do in small ponies also. It's just a little harder, I suppose. Yeah, yeah but back then, no, it was ninety six or ninety seven. Uh, no one would do that. I see. Uh, and then we started and actually from then on we did a lot of uh, scientific work also with them in partnership with the uh, University of Wisconsin even. And so a lot of publications on the uh, reproductive parameters we did and in 99 I went to Germany to do my PhD because I was 
I began my PhD in 1999 and then I received a grant to spend uh, some months in Germany. That's nice. So, so how, I went, how did you did you choose Germany or was it just a coincidence that you went to I was no because in my university uh, they have a partnership with Germany since 19 the 1950s. Oh wow. I see. Some professors of uh, Hanover went there. They lived there for a while, and so there's a strong German culture on the uh, veterinary medicine in Brazil. I see. So a lot of people went there. But I, I must confess something. I didn't like that. I wanted to go to the United States. <laughs> okay, right. And I said, oh, Germany, this is not for me. I will have to learn German. And one day my advisor, uh, he went to proceed with the work I was doing that was about endometritis in mares. Right. And what we did, we used the neutrophils from the same mare to treat the endometritis so we use no antibiotics mm -hmm. is a treatment we and so a friend of mine was already in germany and he was doing some tests with, with neutrophils and he came to the idea of freezing them hmm. so instead of a procedure that lasted uh, half an hour or so any vet in the farm could buy the frozen neutrophils and apply to the mares and that's it. Mm -hmm. And he was looking for someone to go there and, and do this and bring them to Brazil to treat the mares. But uh, my friend of German origin, uh, uh, she, she is uh, from her father is from Germany, and and she didn't want to go. She said, I don't like them there. I don't want to go. I don't want to do PhD. <laughs> and so one day, my, out of the blue, my advisor said, you are to go to Germany. You start learning German now. I and see. I, so that's what you did then. I was like, yeah. I had to do that. It was no, so I studied like two years because uh, it, it was well, well in advance to prepare. And I must say, uh, even with my two years of learning, it was difficult when I arrived there. Yeah, I bet. But uh, you will only learn if you go to the streets, talk to people. And then I went to Hanover in 99. I was very welcome because my advisor from there, Professor Klug, he's now deceased uh, in 2011. Uh, he liked the, the Brazilians a lot. Mm. And uh, so we started working with the, the males, collecting blood to freeze the neutrophils. Mm -hmm. And parallelly, I helped him because in Germany, they, in the autumn, they always do the Herbstuntersuchung, Herbst which is going to farms and examining all the males to see if they are okay to to in reproductive way and so I learned a lot with it and also when they arrived two miniature males at the clinic mm -hmm. and no one, one could know what to do with her. They wanted to know if they were pregnant mm -hmm. but uh, no one would dare. German hands inside the <laughs> miniature <laughs> and then Professor Klug would you please palpate this one, this little ones and an ultrasound then? Of course. <laughs> and he, he was uh, 
very happy. I, I, they weren't pregnant, I must say. And I, and he was, uh, I, he was like very proud because when I, as I was palpating, I wrote, went to a blackboard and wrote my find, my findings in German. <laughs> okay, very good, very good. So how long did you stay in Germany? And, uh, um, this first time was six months, and then I went to other periods of uh, months. And in the total, it was one year like okay. that. Because I, I afterwards I did um, work in a farm in North Rhine-Westfalen mm -hmm. with a miniature uh, friend of mine. Uh, I made friends because I went to miniature horse shows and and went, got to know people. And Professor Klug went to do a study with the minis. So I spent uh, four months there doing the reproduction. She had some six stallions and some mare, so we inseminated then we did all everything but everything was written down and then i publish about the semen parameters of them i see so are you still mostly doing reproductive medicine or are you doing all kinds of vet work today no i mostly reproductive medicine mm -hmm. but now i teach at a university Mm -hmm. I've been teaching since, since 2006 now, mm -hmm. but then uh, I became involved also in sports physiology and equine. I see. So I'm doing some studies now on this, but this is mainly because of the Marsha, because when I became involved with the Marsha, I had some students that wanted to parallelly run some study. We, they are in progress now mm -hmm. because we, we must collect some samples with some animals that are in training in Uruguay. I see. And we cannot go to Uruguay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we must finish this study. And so now I have two mares that I compete, but we haven't had anything this year. Mm, I see. So it's sad uh, because mm. the animals, they need to eat, they need to keep training. Of course. And, and that's yeah. bad, but yeah, and then we do what don't. we can. I know. Then when you can't compete, it's really a pity. Because, uh, well, you have to keep them in condition for the, well, eventually, I guess, things will open up and you can continue again. Yeah. We were even to receive two, two guests from abroad to run the march right. this year. Right. And it's, yeah. uh, it's cancelled. Is it, is it cancelled, the march this year? Yes. So nice. the girls, hopefully, they can make it next year i see but we we have already more two or three people asking about mm. yeah this is a bad time really for all of us i suppose so how did your involvement with horses actually start i mean you became a horse vet how did that come to be in brazil ah because my grandpa had a farm in I the see. town where I was born. Mm -hmm. He worked with cattle. He raised Devon cattle. Mm -hmm. But of course, he had uh, cattle horses to do the job. So I became passionate mm -hmm. about horses. In the summer, it was hard to take me off the horse to even to eat. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then I went to, when I went to college, strangely, I wanted to learn about uh, beef cattle because I wanted to continue. But then I noticed it would not be 
something that I could specialize okay. so deeply as with the horses. So I, I went to the horse side and from then on, never have you ever thought so? I see. Yeah. <laughs> That's so great. So can you tell us a little bit more about the Kriosho horse, which I think is one of your big passions? Yeah, the Kriosho is the one of the breeds that uh, is also Brazilian because it's a breed that's established back in the in the fifteen hundreds when South America was discovered and colonized. Mm -hmm. So people came here and uh, of course they brought horses and they were Portuguese and Spanish. And the mm -hmm. south of uh, South America, this part where Argentina, Uruguay and uh, Brazil, my, uh, my state is, mm -hmm. it was considered like uh, nobody's land. Okay. It had no borders. So cattle roamed free and horses too. And there were a lot of wars. For example, here where I live belonged to Spain. Mm. And in Uruguay belonged to Portugal. Right. And they were always fighting and fighting with Argentina. And mm. so and today we have peace. It's amazing to, <laughs> to think of that. So uh, with all these wars and when the treaties and so the some sometimes people abandon the animals. Right. So for example in Buenos Aires the Creole, the Argentinian criollo originates from horses that uh, governor called Pedro de Mendoza uh, he had to leave and abandon the horses there. So they were migrating until they reached Patagonia. Right. And in Brazil too, there were a lot of horses roaming free as well as in Uruguay. But one guy from Argentina was who rescued the Creole breed. Because the Farmers who are crossing with the total bread, they were completely mm. losing the breed. So he went to Patagonia and bought some horses from a local Indian chief. Mm -hmm. And so the modern Criollo, so to say, is original from them. In Brazil, uh, they brought a lot of uh, Chilean Criollos to cross with because they say it's a more beautiful type or then they have more more um, how could I say they are uh, they are easier to maneuver and so but uh, they don't have the resistance the stamina that the endurance creoles are do they have okay because so would you say that there's different type of criollo or criollos, as you say, in, in Brazil? Are there different types? Like, is there still the cattle type and is there the more modern endurance type? Yeah, like uh, the endurance type is mostly a uh, uh, bloodline that is uh, it's from the farm called Line Vernada in Uruguay. Mm -hmm. And they have a very different type. If you look at them, they are uh, higher than the, the cattle criollo type mm -hmm. because the cattle criollo is now bred uh, for one competition called freno de oro. That means golden bit. Right. And uh, the freno de oro consists of many uh, kinds of uh, competitions together in three days, mm -hmm. like uh, Palechada, which is two guys uh, surrounding a cow and bringing her to a point and, and back. Right. The Mangueira, which is the coral, the cutting. Mm -hmm. mm, let's see. And what else? 
the, it's like a raining part too. Right. So, but the, the endurance criollos are almost like a separate breed. Mm. Right. And what they do is amazing because they go to the marcha only with uh, pasture and water. <laughs> yeah, they are very, very hardy horses actually as yeah. lucky to ride some and they are just amazing. They are just like machines. They just go on and on and uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, they feed them grass and they give them water. They don't really feed them all kinds of supplements and, and grain yeah. and stuff. Yeah, that is... Amazing horses. Mm -hmm. Well, it's so great to talk with you about a little bit about yourself. And um, yeah, I want to really invite you uh, again and again to talk with me about mostly about some health issues and horses to do a little bit like ask your vet episodes in future. So I'm so happy that you consented to join me in that. So, but today, as I said, this issue is just about you. So I want to ask you something which I ask all of my guests. And we call them rapid fire questions. So it's basically okay. I ask a and you can just answer me the first thing which comes to your mind, okay? Mm hmm Perfect. So what is your must pack item on any trip? Any trip? Uh, so uh, door flex, which is a painkiller if I want if I going to write. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Uh, it's certainly important if you're writing. So when you when you travel, are you more a long-term planner or are you a very spontaneous winged style traveler? I like to plan a lot. Okay. So what's your favorite horse breed? Georges. <laughs> uh, if you can spend one year uh, paid off, where would you go? Mongolia. <laughs> <laughs> I see. I've been to already. But right, yeah, I, 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 I saw it on your blog. Yeah, that's amazing. It's a beautiful host country. So besides riding, what other hobby do you have? I like reading. I like uh, seeing movies, but uh, haven't done that much. Uh, I think that's, that's it. <laughs> oh, well, that's a lot, I think. So what's your biggest addiction? Riding. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think that's mine too. Are you an early bird or a night owl? Early bird. What book are you currently reading? I'm reading a book about, I bought in Ireland about uh, interesting and funny cases of horse racing. Ah, it's short stories that happen in horse, ra horse racing and they, sometimes they are very funny. <laughs> I bet. Well, I guess the Irish are big in horse racing. So what, yes. was, what was the last horse movie you watched? I like uh, re-watched uh, Sea Biscuit. Ah, nice one. Also, also about horse racing. Yes. That's a nice one. Great. So Adriana, thank you so much for being here with me today. And uh, I'm really looking forward to talk to you again very soon to record our first uh, Ask You Wet episode. Okay. I would be delighted to do that. So thank you, Ute, for calling me. It was a pleasure to do this interview with you for a question not fit to ask. Exactly. So if uh, anyone has a question, they can send it to you and we can do it uh, exactly. next we can, time. We can discuss it the next time. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Adriana, just give me one second. I'll, put, I'll plug in the cable because otherwise my laptop is out of battery. And then shall we just record the first one? Are you, okay. Are you, still, are you still free to go on for like another half an hour or 20 minutes? Okay, no problem. Okay, just give me one second. I'll plug in my laptop. I'll be back in a minute. Okay. 
problem. Yeah, I am. <laughs> I have to just find a way. That one up here. Vocês têm que fazer uma arte para ler. Só mais uns minutinhos. Oh. Perfect. <laughs> okay, now we have a bit more power again. So, okay. Um, yeah, as I said, I want to start on what every horse owner should know about horses. So I've okay. uh, noted a few things down. What, what do you think? Um, so I basically, I was thinking to... What does it do? Okay, what every horse owner or rider should know about horses. So I, I, I put down a few notes. I, I, I put down that horses cannot throw up, that they cannot vomit, that horses, mm -hmm. that horses breathe only through their nose, not through their mouth, so that in case of they get any allergy or a bee sting and the, na the nasal passage swells up, they can actually suffer, um, they might suffocate because they can't breathe. Uh, yeah. I think that's, that's very important to know. Then I think it's interesting to talk a little bit about horse vision because horses see so mm -hmm. different, like they can't see red and green and they have a good night vision and they have this kind of uh, mm -hmm. monocular vision and uh, about that they eat all the time, that they should eat all the time actually. And mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that's kind of the things which came to my mind. What do you think is also important to discuss? Well, about uh, something about uh, feeding that you have, mm. but uh, do you do you want to ask first and I respond or? Yeah, kind just, of. Uh, may, maybe we do it kind of a little bit in, in a talk. Like um, again, I say like welcome, and today we discuss uh, about some topics that every horse owner rider should know about horses, and then I okay. can. Yeah, maybe I can I, I can say like, okay, I first thing say uh, horses can't breathe through the mouth, only through the nose. So then you yeah. say... Yeah, I think it's important to clarify about uh, feeding because mm -hmm. um, most uh, first uh, time owners, they don't know how to feed the horse and they think the horse needs uh, 